Good morning, branches. Um, the psalm reading this morning slipped through the cracks, but I think it's actually an appropriate time to read it, and I'll say why. It's a very short one. Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even, even life forevermore. And uh, I just actually got a visual of that when we were praying for uh, the Eshman family. I just pictured John with his thick beard and uh, a cup of oil being poured over his head and flowing down through his beard. And, and to me, it just spoke to me that you have the Lord's blessing uh, and you'll experience unity as a family. And uh, so go forward with, with great expectation. Yeah. Today we'll be discussing some um, roles and goals of relationships within what I, I want to call uh, relational community. Now, <clears throat> as a part of the interim pastoral team, uh, I'm up in front of you, for better or for worse, uh, more often than usual, and you will certainly pick up on some of my tendencies and uh, idiosyncrasies. For example, I have developed this habit of writing my, my, my sermons now out word for word. Uh, it could be because you know, I've been doing so many funerals over the years, and uh, I just never want to be in a place of misspeaking uh, to a crowd of grieving people. And, um, or it could be that uh, the age factor that I'm no longer trusting myself to take a bullet point and develop it you know, cohesively and coherently uh, without wandering or searching for words or filling the pauses with uh or you know. So whatever the case, the written word seems to give me more a sense of security right now, but I realize in, in so doing that sometimes I'm not making the kind of eye contact or connection that I desire. So know that that's within my heart. Um, also, I don't intend to cry every time I speak, I promise you. <laughs> but these days, I never know when I'm going to share some kind of story, you know, obviously, whether about Boog or about hospice patients or students or, or just even, even reading a, a passage that's so familiar to me, but somehow it just hits your strikes your emotions in that moment. So it's a little bit unpredictable. I'm a, I'm a work in progress, so I appreciate your patience and, and support. So today we're going to continue our study uh, in Philippians, picking up uh, chapter 2, verses 19 through 30. At first glance, I found this, this passage a little challenging to expound upon because there was no particular verses that, that jumped out. But uh, on, a, on a second reading, uh, as, as Ryan mentioned, uh, verse 20 sort of surfaced. And uh, with Paul fondly, when Paul fondly spoke of his protege, Timothy, saying, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. We will unpack that special relationship a little bit uh, and uh, th that they share and the roles they play. And then I'm going to expand that discussion, um, kind of taking a wider scope, touching on some of the roles and goals of relationships within uh, what I'm calling relational community. So allow me to read the text, and then we'll gather in uh, small groups for a couple minutes uh, for discussion. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send you uh, send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also uh, your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. 
for he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. So let's um, get into groups of uh, four to six people, and I'll have a couple of questions uh, for you. And basically, it's going to be centered around this notion of, you know, we could all use a Timothy in our lives. Uh, there are also plenty of women examples in Scripture. I think immediately of Ruth in the Old Testament. We could all use a Ruth in our lives, someone who is so devoted and supportive of us. So uh, get quickly get into groups of four to six people, and I'll have a, a couple of questions. The questions, right? Question one is, was there someone in your life of whom you would say, I have no one else like him or her? Obviously, your spouse would be, you know, a special person in your life. But try to think of someone outside of your spouse, okay? Uh, so, someone that you would say there's no one else like him or her. Could be a boss, mentor, could be subordinate, could be coworker, could be a friend, etc. And then the second question, what were the key qualities that made your relationship special? Okay, so just take a few minutes to share those things. Okay, if I can get your attention up front again. The engagement in our little groups bodes well for what I'm going to share the rest of the service here. So when I'm, when I'm using the terms relationship and community, I'm thinking of deeper versus superficial levels of engagement. We all know that we can be in community without being in relationship. But true community is the expression of relating to one another at the deepest level. So I want to give you a little visual here that I thought of last night. You can throw eggs, milk, butter, and flour in a bowl, right? You see all that? All right. But it doesn't mean you're going to make good pancakes. <laughs> Those ingredients must be integrated, gently blended together to make sure they are in proper relationship with one another in order to have the desired outcome. Nobody likes lumpy, watery pancakes. So let's highlight two kinds of relationships that are necessary to, to blend these ingredients. The first one. Uh, is an obvious one uh, with Timothy and Paul, right? Is uh, this mentoring, mentoring relationships. And the second would be more of a kind of the, hor you know, uh, horizontal, if you will, uh, friendship or brotherly or sisterly love. Paul, Timothy, Epaphroditus, and the Philippians are, in this moment, are certainly making good pancakes. Paul and Timothy had a close, meaningful, mentoring kind of relationship. Timothy was a disciple of Paul, whom he met during one of his missionary journeys. Paul would take Timothy under his wing and played a significant role in shaping his faith and ministry. In this text and elsewhere, Paul tenderly refers to Timothy as being like a son. He entrusted him with important responsibilities within the early church and commended him for his faithfulness and dedication. Timothy, in turn, respected Paul, admired him as a spiritual father figure and faithfully followed his instructions. Their relationship was marked by mutual respect, trust, and a shared commitment to spreading the gospel. Paul often wrote to Timothy to offer him guidance, encouragement, and support in his ministry endeavors. They traveled and worked together to establish and strengthen churches in various regions, uh, with Timothy continuing Paul's work after he passed away. Overall, their relationship exemplifies the importance of mentorship, and discipleship in Christian faith, and serves as a model for how older and younger believers can support and edify one another in their spiritual journeys. Secondly, not only do we need healthy mentoring relationships in our faith communities, we, but we need friendship, uh, a kind of bond that feels like family. The theologian uh, Henry Nouwen describes friendship this way. Uh, just close your eyes for a minute and just... Uh, as I read this quote from him uh, and take it in. 
When we honestly ask ourselves which person in our lives means the most to us, we often find that it is those who, instead of giving advice, solutions, or cures, have chosen rather to share our pain and touch our wounds with a warm and tender hand. The friend who can be silent with us in a moment of despair or confusion, who can say with us in an hour of grief and bereavement, who can tolerate not knowing, not curing, not healing, and face with us the reality of our powerlessness. That is a friend who cares. So let's analyze this a little bit to help us discern the important qualities of friendship, the kind of bond that we want to share with our brothers and sisters. Certainly Timothy was more than just a devoted disciple. He was an example of a friend who cares. Paul says there is no one else like him. Why? Because he takes a genuine interest in your welfare. That should be the first quality of friendship. Someone who cares for our welfare. Remember, all of this is being built on that foundational model and attitude of Jesus, who in humility was caring for the interests of others ahead of himself. I think this is a good description of Timothy. We know that Paul suffered much hardship and sorrow, shipwrecked, bitten by poisonous snakes, imprisoned in shackles, driven out of towns, stoned and left for dead, constantly mocked and mistreated. Paul needed others in his ministry, not only as co-workers, to go through these hardships with him, but he needed someone who would just listen, who would share his pain, tend to his wounds, help to bear his sorrows and grief. We know that our faith journey is not just a spiritual path, but it is full of emotional experiences. Paul speaks of God's mercy sparing him sorrow upon sorrow by bringing meaningful relationships around him in his time of need. In moments of joy, isn't it always more meaningful to celebrate with others? And when you find yourselves in moments of despair, more comforting to have a friend who cares, even in just silent presence, rather than being alone? Sometimes deeper friendship only emerges when there is shared experience, especially through difficult circumstances. I can enjoy my neighbor. Maybe we have a lot in common. Maybe our personalities blend. Maybe we like the same sports team or the same beer, whatever. But I will never possibly be as close to my neighbor friend as two soldiers in the same foxhole. Those soldiers may have little in common. Perhaps their personalities clash but going through the horror of war together will create the kind of bond that is deep and unbreakable. Obviously, I see the same kind of bonding uh, take place in hospice care as together people face the fear and pain and sorrow of death and the dying experience. This kind of community uh, is what we are called to develop. But it won't, it won't just happen on Sunday morning. It comes through the collective experience of being fully engaged in God's calling and cultivating meaningful relationships in the process. So in addition to our relationship roles, I want to highlight two goals as well of relational community. Those would be unity and what I will call uh, bodybuilding. So when there is relationship, mentoring, friendship, and shared experience within community, there is a better chance to foster unity. In the short psalm that I read earlier, uh, the first verse says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard. This theme, of course, is echoed throughout scriptures and profoundly emphasized within the teachings and prayers of Jesus and the other apostles. And therefore, it represents a significant tenet in the Christian faith. Earlier in chapter 2, Paul urges the believers in Philippi to be of one mind, united in spirit, resolving to one purpose. 
This unity is essential for growth and effectiveness of the church, as exemplified by, uh, in this text by Timothy, and we'll call him Epaph for short. <clears throat> so why is it so important? Because it exemplifies the unity uh, within the Trinity. In John 17, Jesus prays that his followers may be one, just as he and the Father are one. Our unity, therefore, is meant to reflect this perfect unity of Father, Son, and Spirit. Secondly, unity can build strength. In Ecclesiastes 4, it says, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. When we are united, we are stronger and better equipped to face life's challenges and adversity. Furthermore, unity is a testimony to the world. Jesus says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Last week, we spoke of uh, being shining stars. Well, unity is a powerful manifestation of light and love. Unfortunately, unity in the church is often challenged by division, conflict, disagreements. We see this even in the early church as Paul addresses factions in the Corinthian church and disputes even among the Philippians. Today, as Christians, we also face challenges in trying to maintain unity with fellow believers who have different perspectives or opinions on certain matters. The Philippian believers were far from perfect, but we see in this text a wonderful display of unity. Everyone working together harmoniously, generated by the mutual concern for the welfare of one another. With Timothy, Epaph, and Paul being selfless instruments of care, concern, and sacrifice to facilitate this relational bond with each other and the community, even to the point of risking death and enduring um, suffering and loneliness. There is so much more we can say about unity, but um, the main point in today's teaching is that when we cultivate deeper relationships, we are creating a better environment to facilitate unity. So let us prioritize the same kind of humility and selflessness in our interactions with one another. When I develop a relationship with you, I'm obliged to pull my head out of my own bubble of trouble. <laughs> and I naturally begin to think and care more about your welfare. And that care and concern you receive from me is more naturally reciprocated. That relational exchange then allows us to be more unified and more likely to avoid conflict. Unity takes effort, prayer, and humility. But it is a worthy goal, for it is a, a pursuit that is after the heart of God. And it begins when we deepen our relationships. Finally, the second goal I'm addressing today is the goal of bodybuilding. You wouldn't think that I'm into bodybuilding, but... Um, relational community not only fosters unity, but it builds the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 describes the body of Christ, and I'll just read a short section, 22 through 26, uh, but there's a whole, a whole chapter that describes it. It says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, the, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put together the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. The entire chapter highlights the importance of everyone being a part of the body and everyone playing a role, great or small. There are those leading actors, but there is an entire supporting cast that is necessary to make the body work. So that is, <clears throat> so that is coordinated and achieving the, its purpose without faltering. 
We need each other. Everyone has a role to play. No part of the body can say it does not need another part. Paul understood this teaching on the body of Christ because uh, he's the one who authored it. And so we see here in Philippians and in other places, Paul is taking time to acknowledge, to highlight, and to thank members of the body. If Paul's missionary journeys were uh, an epic series or movie, he would be the leading actor, and he would have some other co-stars, and Barnabas and Silas, and other supporting actors playing key roles in certain episodes like uh, Timothy or Priscilla and Aquila, amongst others. The director of the movie would be the Holy Spirit, who often intervenes and rewrites the script. And then there would be a lot of cast members and production crew, etc., behind the scenes who contribute in considerable ways, with little fanfare, other than perhaps just showing up in the credits. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it. It has always been this way, and we should never underestimate the significant contributions of the supporting cast. God sees and honors those who are unseen. In this text, much like the beginning of the book, it's like Paul is giving an, an acceptance speech, and he's recounting and remembering all of those people that may be behind the scenes but are critical, critical to the body and have been essential to his mission, without whom he could have never completed it. Here, Timothy and Epaph are being recognized, but there's uh, one obvious group that is often overlooked in this patriarchal context of the scriptures, the women who in reality played an integral role in the expansion of the early church and throughout church history, often in the shadows as a supporting cast. It's been spoken of prior, but Jesus certainly broke the mold in his interactions with women, the significant role women played in his ministry, and even uh, in friendship where women like Mary and Martha were part of his inner circle of friends. It was telling that Mary Magdalene was the first one entrusted to encounter the risen Christ before any of the disciples, and that Jesus would see and honor the widow who only had a mite to her name, but dropped it in the offering basket. Whether women or men, older or younger, single or married, any healthy church is dependent upon members who selflessly serve behind the scenes in humility thinking of others before themselves. We applaud and are grateful for those of you serving at branches in this capacity and in this character. Again, it's my assertion that if we deepen our relationships with others in our community through mentoring and bonding friendships, everyone will naturally feel more recognized, more motivated, and more empowered to play their role as a member of the body great or small, leading or supporting, every member is honored and essential to help the body to function properly and fulfill its high calling. I want to invite the worship team to come forward and I'll close with a final thought. Relational community is not an easy endeavor in our society. Individualism is deeply embedded and American culture and mindset. In some areas, it has served us well. We are independent, competitive, entrepreneurial, driven, goal-oriented. It can lead to great achievements and the pursuit of personal happiness. But when it comes to following certain aspects of our faith, it can prove to be a significant hurdle. We naturally identify with those stories and verses that highlight individual faith and heroics. Running the race, slaying the giant, parting the Red Sea. However, community engagement is not an individual sport. Furthermore, our individualistic mindset reinforces the notion of personal property and space. And as a prosperous nation, we figure that everyone can take care of themselves. All of this works against us when we try to relate to the early church and how they experienced friendship and community. 
sharing everything in common. All that to say, we may need to experience some personal transformation, a changing of our mindset before we are even capable of deepening our relationships. Either way, the call to relational community remains the same. So branches, as we engage in this process of cultivating deeper relationships and striving towards unity, building up the body, may we begin to observe and to hear and to speak those words over one another. I have no one else like her. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. We have the ingredients. Try not to make a mess. We have the ingredients and we have the tools and branches to make great pancakes. So let's get about. Amen. I'll just close in prayer and then. Heavenly Father, none of what I've spoken of today can be accomplished without your presence in our lives and in the heart of our community. We invite your spirit to fill us and empower us to become more humble, more selfless, more aware of the needs of those around us and to develop a genuine interest in their well-being. Help us to cultivate deeper, more meaningful relationships that will propel us towards greater unity that will inspire everyone to seek and fulfill their roles as essential members of the body so that we as a collective community may fulfill your calling. We pray in the unifying name.